today uh, we would be uh, watching a video from GCI International. It is from the series You Are Included, where are uh, the Grace Communion International theologian Dr. Gary Dado. He interviews uh, Dr. Gaudi Zegler. Uh, he is the author of the book Trinitarian Grace and Participation. You know. And he, his book is based on the theology of T.F. Torrance. And then he also discuss about the various relational shape of God's grace. Uh, who is Dr. Gordy Ziegler? He is a pastor of adult discipleship and form, formation at Columbia Presbyterian Church in Vancouver. He served a church in California for nine years before moving to Scotland to pursue his doctoral degree. He received then the PhD from the University of uh, Aberdeen in 2014. And his book, uh, Trinitarian Grace and Participation, uh, that was his thesis and that was also his book. So what we would do is we would watch the video. The video is about 20 to 23 minutes. And then we will discuss various aspects, both the author and uh, Dr. Gary Dedo, they are talking about. I have, uh, I, I went through this video beforehand and I pointed out few of the discussion topics. So we'll see after the uh, video and we'll then take up the different topic and discuss about it. So let me share my screen. On this episode of You're Included, Pastor Dr. Jordi Ziegler speaks about his book, Trinitarian Grace and Participation, an entry into the theology of T.F. Torrance, and discusses the profoundly personal and relational shape of God's grace. Our host is Dr. Gary Detto. Well, welcome. Thank you. It's good to be here. Great to have you. So uh, tell us a little bit about uh, yourself first. Uh, uh, I know that um, you uh, went to Scotland and, and studied theology and that you've been involved in pastoral ministry uh, since then. So what led you to go to study theology anyway in the first place? Why do that? <laughs> um, I just fell in love with the Bible. Um, I got exposed to it in college. I didn't go to a Christian college, but I uh, attended a Bible school for one semester and fell in love with it. And that kind of sent me to seminary. And uh, it, so I was at Regent College for seminary and that ended up kind of sparking some things that I couldn't let go of and eventually led to, to Scotland. Well, that led to a, a big project, didn't it? That lasted quite a few years. Mm -hmm. And uh, and eventually a book came out of it, which yeah. I was uh, happy to read actually. And I love I love the title that you came up with, and it in indicates uh, the, the core of your interest, uh, Trinitarian grace and participation. Mm -hmm. Now you know there's a million theological topics that you could have chosen, right. and uh, and pursued for what three four years uh, or longer. Uh, well, <laughs> anyway, six years. Yeah, so that's a lot of time and, and a lot of effort. So this, this, tell us about this Trinitarian grace. It seemed to me to capture a lot of what you were interested in and wanted yeah. to explore. Yeah, yeah. So maybe I need to go back then to your first question to to kind of prepare for that because um, when I was in seminary, I I had I went to Regent College, which was fantastic. Um, some wonderful teachers there. I had. My theology classes were from people like J.I. Packer and Stanley Grenz. And, but at the, at the end of my second year, Alan Torrance came to Regent College and taught a, a class on Christology, on Jesus. And I ended up being his TA for it, not because I was helping teach, just because somebody had to make copies and pick him up from the airport. <laughs> but I sat in on his class and I read the book that he recommended, which was The Mediation of Christ by Thomas Torrance. And, and I felt like I was hearing the gospel for the first time. Mm. Um, not that I wasn't a Christian before or anything like that. It was just, I got excited about what I was hearing mm. in a way that I had never felt before. Um, I think, uh, you know, if I had to identify what was new, 
I think the big things were that the incarnation, when God becomes human, is not just a, an experiment that God did to get a job done for 33 years, but it was an eternal decision that the incarnation continues in the ascension, um, that God retains his humanity, that he doesn't leave it behind. That stunned me. I, I know it's in our creed and we say that, <laughs> but it just never, the penny never dropped for me mm -hmm. that that was the way it is. And for me, that, that showed that God's love was on a scale that I never understood before. Mm which then forced me to, to think back on, well, what was the basis for God and his relationship to me? And I, I think the truth is my understanding, my assumption, even though I was Trinitarian and, you know, would never doubt that, for God for me primarily was ruler. He was Lord, mm. he's mm. sovereign, he's almighty, he's God. Um, th that's the way that we tend to talk in church. Um, and we, Trinity, God was Father, Son, and Spirit was, you know, we don't do a lot of that with that a lot of times in church. And, uh, and so if God is ruler, and if that's the primary thing that defines him, then my, then that means, well, it, first of all, it means that, that he needed a creation to, to rule. Mm -hmm. He needed mm -hmm. people to, to be the rule followers. And, my, then my job is to be a rule, to follow his rules, to um, be a dutiful servant, to live in gratitude. And, um, and that's kind of the setup, the framework. But if, but if the core of who God is, is that he's father, then, and father, son, and spirit, then that, then, then that changes the relationship. That changes the mm -hmm. basis. Um, Athanasius said that before God is creator, he was father. And that means that before there was a creation, father, son, and spirit were together in love and they chose to make this creation out of the freedom of their love. And that just changed the playing field. It was a game changer for me in terms of my understanding of how God related to us as human beings and um, got me excited and I couldn't let it go. And so that that kind of buzzed in me for nine years as I was a pastor in California and eventually led to us kind of selling everything and moving our family to Scotland, which was a great experience for all of us mostly. Um, but it was, it was, uh, that was what drove us. And, and the theme then, the topic that I was passionate about um, was understanding what is, what is God's grace and Trinitarian Grace and Participation is the, the title of the book. It, it's a subtitle, An Entry into the Theology of Thomas Torrance. So mm -hmm. that's kind of how it got there. I think yeah. you're, you're asking about why the, why the title. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's, you know, a lot of people would just say, well, you know, grace, we all know what grace is, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, it, you know, it's simple, it's easy. Right. Um, but, uh, yeah, is it really just that simple and easy, especially just common, ordinary yeah. uh, answers to what grace is? I I'm sure your exploration to that uh, uh, revealed some, some things about it. I think most people, when they think of grace, and this is also within church history, there's kind of ways that grace has been understood over time. Uh, probably one of the most common is that it's it's kind of a thing. It's a commodity. It's something you can bank uh, and possess. And if you have more grace, then you are more able to be a spiritual person or do good things. Mm -hmm. um, and so one version of it is is kind of to commodify grace. I, I call it the pharmaceuticalization of grace, <laughs> um, where it's like this pill. And if we get it or we can store them, then we have more of it. Um, other people talk about grace like it's uh, it's more of a, a legal, an impersonal legal transaction. Um, and that's more of the, a law court image for grace and that it just at this, this single moment is all that it's about. And it's kind of, it's not personal. It's just something that happens, has to happen. It's focused on the cross. Um, and then another way people think of grace is it's kind of uh, it's like a tool. It it's, uh, helps you 
you know, it's a little divine boost, a mm. power bar oh, you can uh. <laughs> take. And uh, but all those versions of grace, they're all they're all impersonal. Mm. Uh, they they miss the essence of grace, which is God giving Himself to us uh, in Christ through the Spirit. And the title of the book is it's a bit um, redundant. People don't know it's redundant, but it actually is redundant because grace is not just one unidirectional, it's, it's, it's like a boomerang. So God gives himself in Christ through the Spirit so that we would participate in his life. The purpose is relationship. Mm. Uh, so we like to say, we, we tell people, oh, grace is a, a free gift with no strings attached. It's actually not. The purpose of the gift is for relationship. A gift with no strings attached is like you don't care. Um, you leave it on the doorstep and walk away and nobody knows it doesn't actually make a closer relationship. Mm -hmm. It blesses the person that got it, mm -hmm. which is a very individualistic version of maybe what grace would be. But God's purpose in grace is to actually give himself to us so that we would share in his life. Yeah, that, that, that's a good illustration. Uh, I like that. Yeah, that no strings attached. I think that could, uh, you know, another version, uh, I've been aware of, it's an exception to a rule. So back to that, you're, you're talking about God being the ruler, right. you know? Yeah. So in that framework, and I think it's, it's the one that largely kind of affected me for a lot of my life was God is gracious. And what that means is he makes exceptions to right. rules. Right, yep. And, and that's it. Right. A and I didn't know anymore. I knew there was something else to it, mm -hmm. but I didn't know how it connected. Mm -hmm. Yeah, or will you say what grace is uh, getting what you don't deserve? Uh, so, mm -hmm. which, sure, we agree with, but if that's the core definition, it's the same thing. You don't deserve this. It's not really something you're supposed to have. It never was God's intent, but he's going to break the rule and mm -hmm. give you it anyway. Make an, make make an, an exception. exception. But that's pretty impersonal, too, in a way. It's, mm -hmm. it's not, not what you were talking about in terms of the gift of a relationship mm -hmm. by him giving himself to us. Right. Yeah, that's a, that's a different thing. Another thing I, I noticed in reading your, your book, um, you were talking about the connection between God's love and God's mm -hmm. grace. And I thought that was an important uh, differentiation you were making. Tell us, uh, about that, the love of God and the mm -hmm. grace of God. How are they distinct? How are they, of course, connected? Right. They're both from God. Yeah. So God's love is who he is in himself. He is love. Father, Son, and Spirit share this love in their life. They always have. They don't need us. They're not lonely. But God, in the freedom of his love, chooses to share that. So he makes a world, makes a universe. He didn't have to. <laughs> There didn't have to be anything, but there is. I remember the first time um, one of my supervisor in Aberdeen said that. He's like, you know, none of this had to be. He's like, oh, I guess that's true. <laughs> you know, God didn't have to have kids. He didn't mm -hmm. have to have a universe, but he did. So grace is his love extended beyond himself. Mm -hmm. um, so in that sense, what he, when he gives us himself, it's, uh, his love is poured out, as, mm. as uh, Paul says, his love is being poured out into our hearts. That is his grace, and the purpose of that is that we would share in his life and, uh, and become like him because of that. Yeah, that's, that's, I, I find that uh, very helpful, especially, yeah, would grace be grace if God had to be gracious? <laughs> right? It's like, no, yeah. it, it, it wouldn't. Um, and I, I think that's, that's important. You know, there's a lots of, I'm sure you've run into this in ministry. Uh, we say God is love. That's absolutely true. You can find that in First John, right? right. Uh, there's not a problem with that. But the thing is, I find that often people don't know how to fill that out, or they just fill in the notion of love mm. in any old way. Right. That seems to me they're not recognized. Right. The, the form of love is, is what we call right. grace. Yeah. Yeah. Um, grace has a, a shape, a form. Love, so love has a shape and a form. 
And the form that it takes that's revealed to us is God comes and it's self-giving love, mm. sacrificial love. Um, and we see that lived out in Jesus. Um, people often say, oh, I like Jesus. I'm not so sure about the Father. You know, should we even <laughs> call him Father? He's kind of scary. Um, the Spirit is confusing, but I like Jesus. I don't think those people have read everything Jesus said because mm. <laughs> he, you know, he is challenging. Um, he calls us to a way of life that's like his, which is, is love poured out. Um, so you had that kind of self-giving uh, nature and that it has a form. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of the notion of love today, just generally in the culture, is just being kind or or nice, and it, I mean, you may be helpful or, or something rather like that. You use the word sacrificial. Say say more about that. What's what's the sacrificial side of of grace? Well, because this world that God made has resisted Him and turned away um, because of our sin, um, and sin the way I the way I think of sin. I think the way scripture describes sin, it's, it's our, it's reliance on ourselves rather than dependence upon God. Um, we, you could say it's faith and trust, but those words kind of become blurry to people. Mm -hmm. Um, but trust really is reliance upon God, dependence upon God rather than reliance upon ourselves. And, um, so that's, that, that because of our sin, the world that God comes into is a world that needs redemption, a world that is broken and needs healing. And so he deals with it. He enters mm -hmm. it fully. He, he doesn't just made, wave a magic wand to, to fix things from a distance. Uh, if he did, you know, could God have done that? Well, if he could have, it would have been a very impersonal way oh, to yeah, deal but, with the mm -hmm. issue. Mm -hmm. So even if now you, I, I think you could say, well, given the nature of who God is, he wouldn't. Um, he deals with everything personally. There is nothing that God does that is not personal. And I think within our, within our culture, within our ways of understanding uh, God and ourselves and church, we, we do a lot of things that are impersonal. We functionalize people. We functionalize systems. We... Uh, we treat people as problems rather than as human beings. Um, and that's just not the way that Jesus relates to us. That's not the way God relates to us. And so love calls for that kind of personalness of entering into the, the difficulties of life with people. Um, not from a distance, not making just big policies, but, but life on life. Um, which is hard and slow and takes a lot of patience, but God is patient. Yes, right. He teaches us how to be. Yeah, so we just don't kind of throw in our own definitions of what love is, but right, see it actually, it's demonstrated in a particular way in Jesus himself. Mm -hmm. um, and that's a very particular And the ultimate pattern. is, of course, on the cross. That's his love. It's the obedience of his love to the cross um, that he that he shows it to the fullest extent. And I think that love, it's not only a love for humanity that Jesus that God shows in the cross, it's it's Jesus's love of the Father that he shows mm. and his trust in the Father to to have his will align with the Father's will in the garden, be committed to trust the Father to that place. Um, and you know, that's, that's how reconciliation took place. So it's really Jesus' love for us has its root in his love for the Father. Mm -hmm. And it has the same shape expressed towards us. Yeah, yeah that's, uh, that's interesting. And that goes back to the Trinitarian nature, mm -hmm. right? Jesus' relationship with the Father yeah. is one of love and is his that same love is extended towards us, right. that's grace because it needs to address right, the problem 
uh, our alienation or distrust um, and the brokenness uh, of it. Can you say just a word, one more thing here? You know, a lot of people pit love or even grace against kind of God's wrath or God's judgment. Mm -hmm. Um, can you say just, I know it's a huge topic, can you say <laughs> just just a, a word, because uh, a lot of people just think they're opposite, but yeah. we see both in the New Testament right. and in Jesus' ministry. Yeah. yeah, they are, it is a terrible idea to put, here's God's love and here's His justice or His wrath, and because, you know, He loves us, but He's got to satisfy this, and so there's some sort of negotiation deal, and here's the deal, mm -hmm. you know, that's been worked out among the lawyers and and that's just a, a terrible way of, of talking about who God is and his attributes. Um, somebody recently sent me something from a Bible study that they were a part of and it's a, just a list of God's attributes. There's about 30 or 40 of them. And when you make a list, none is more important than the other. Or maybe here's the most important and here's number two and number three, but it becomes uh, it becomes just this list. Um, the reality is everything God does is a flow from His love. So His wrath is an expression of His love. Uh, his commitment to justice and righteousness is the, the, uh, the expression of His love. And, and so His wrath is Him saying no when we resist Him. You know, we say no, He says no to our no. And that's because of love. If my kid is going to run out on the street, I'm going to grab them and pull them back. Mm -hmm. And that may hurt their arm when I do that. And they may cry and be upset at me, but it's because of love that I'm seeking to protect mm -hmm. them and care for them. It's not because I'm angry. They may experience it even as anger, but it's, mm -hmm. but it's not necessarily anger. It's, it's actually because of love. Yeah, they might think you're against them or right. kind of against, you know, Rather than no, you're you're actually expressing. That's a good example. You're expressing being for them, mm -hmm. uh, to watch out for them or to prevent harm mm -hmm. uh, and and damage. Yeah, I think that's a very important uh, point. Um, well, thanks for sharing uh, with all that. Yeah, uh, these are very interesting, very important things, and I'm I'm sure it's uh, key to your ministry. Uh, to, to try to help the, help people grasp this more deeply. It is. I mean, what I what I want people to recognize is God's grace isn't just some generic commodity. It's the invitation to participate in the Son's relationship with the Father, and that that to me is what the Christian life is all about. Great. Well, thanks so much. Sure. Thank you. You've been watching You're Included. Wow, that was quite powerful. So what one thing that stood out to you? As we as you watched the video, I think the concept of grace, as we understand it, is really extends much, much, much further, or much more than you know where God loves us and, and that's it. And he's been merciful to us, but it's much more than that. That's what he was explaining. You know, God's grace is an expression of his love. And even if he is, uh, you know, angry, it's because of love. He wants to correct us and he wants to. So that's all part of grace. And most importantly, it's the, the relationship issue. Why is his love and grace? Because he wants to have a relationship with us. Yeah. Uncle Rao, what one thing that stood out to you? I agree with what uh, <coughs> Mr. Nakar said. Uh, 
you know, for me, uh, the, the grace stood out in the sense we often, in, in a day-to-day -day life, in a conscious or a unconscious way, we often refer to grace of God is a, a, a event or something that helped us in something, right? Oh, God's grace, I managed to do this. He is graceful. It, it, it turns into his blessing. His grace managed the situation. And often, but not noted, in unintentionally, we also kind of make grace impersonal. Right? Because we, we only see his his contribution into our problem or our life or our uh, our challenges, whatever. But it, it remains on that and it often goes with just thanksgiving or, or, or acknowledging or appreciating. But often it doesn't respond back to with that relation, in, you know, uh, involving or, or in getting us into that relationship. And that stood out to me uh, quite vividly. I think also that, you know, our life is, should be completely intertwined with Jesus as his life is intertwined with God the Father. So we are, should be completely mind, body and spirit. In that way, the grace is there. Grace is not a commodity, as he said. It's something completely, he what he is, what he is, not an attribute. Correct, correct. And that's where I like uh, where he defines that sin is a reliance upon ourselves rather than dependence on God. Right? Um, what, what do you think about that? Sin is reliance upon ourselves rather than dependence on God. There's a thin line, right? All of us know uh, that. Any view? Yeah, that's correct. I mean... We sin because we know, we think we know better. You know, despite knowing that this is wrong, we still go ahead and do it because, you know, we want to and so what? So it is putting ourselves uh, first or putting ourselves before God. Right. Any uh, comment, Uncle Ra? No. Okay. Yeah. Can I make, can I? Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. Uh, we, we sin because we know that God is forgiving. Okay. And if, if we don't have his forgiveness, then where is his grace? He's kind. He's kind to us and he loves us as his children. So we are not perfect like him. So yeah, he gives us an opportunity to, to sin. So then we will look to him for his grace, his mercy, his kindness, I think. Mm, no. His love would never allow us to sin. Okay. Uh, in fact, our stepping away, our dependence on ourselves, our ability to use the freedom for ourselves, the very first sin is to become like God, having the knowledge like Him. Despite we were created in His likeness and this thing, the human being still wanted to have that control, knowledge. And that that initiated a sin. So his love would never make us to sin, Vanessa. So he that we would a, come back to him. Never. He gives us a choice. He gives us choices to make. So that right. choices right. that we make are, is either we, we do the right thing or we sin. So by sinning is we get his grace. We get his forgiveness. So that is where the choice is. We have to choose. Yes. So, but that, that, I'm sorry. That implies that uh, you are sinning to get his grace. It's not like that. I mean, you don't sin. Oh, God will forgive me. So let me go ahead and sin. It, it's not that. God doesn't want you to sin. But since our, we are broken people and we are fallen people, we do continue to sin and that's where God says, God's grace comes in that, okay, despite your sinning, I, you're my child and I will uh, look kindly upon it. So that's where the grace is and I don't know, such an if I'm... No, grandly. quite correct. In fact, you see the author, uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Ziegler, he says, 
grace is not unidirectional it's boomerang and then he goes on saying god himself uh, god gives himself to us in christ so that we participate in his life so a grace is a call to participate in that relational uh, way with god that is the grace which should drive us rather than the grace where if we fall short we have a triumph card or joker card that we can use it it should be the other way around and that is why he says grace is god's love extended beyond himself so did did it uh, did it also uh, were you also able to correlate that uh, god's love is a, his grace is a way of expressing his love correct for me that was quite uh, this thing that oh yes it's then Absolutely. yeah and then another thing he touches uh, and i think this is also worth discussing is uh, god's love seen through the angle of judgment and god's wrath and and he points out very this thing that it is not one for the other uh, but it is the one which is the love the love of it is the expression of love that he wants us uh to be in communion with him and wherever we fall short of it is his way of correcting us his way of making sure that we continue to abide in him but not in a way where a ruler will do to its subject we are free to latch on to that helping hand so what what do you think about uh, that I see Mr. Franklin Poppins has joined. Can you hear us, Mr. Poppins? Uh, yes, sir. Okay. Sir, can you hear me, Pastor yes. Sachin? Yes, we can hear you. Ah, uh, yes, sir. Uh, Grace has got many facets, no, sir. Mm -hmm. Grace has got many facets, many aspects. Mm -hmm. You, you would care to elaborate a little more for our knowledge? Ah, so... uh, no, sir. As you rightly pointed out, now it's not merely. a one time event or in the in a in in his intervention but in our relationship correct then another thing um, it, it uh, that i pointed is when he says god is a father first before being a creator mm. and this semester uh, we are doing the study about the survey of the old testament and our uh our instructor dr graham she is a very uh, known this thing so she was explaining the the creation and she said for israelites he was the redeemer first than the creator although the bible starts with genesis the act of creation but if you see how did israelite knew god is they knew him as a redeemer first and then as a creator second and then we when we hear apostle paul in ephesians he tell us that we were chosen even before the creation of this world so so the his aspect relational aspect of being a father and redeemer comes much before than he mm -hmm. is a creator that's true that's a good point mm, very good point and i was bold over that i said wow mm -hmm. so yeah. for israelite it is through experience because god took them out from egypt So, and that's the start of their story and so they know him as redeemer but for us as apostle paul says oh boy goodness before the creation the foundation of this earth you and i were chosen to be in relationship with him and that brings such a wonderful um, uh, yeah, really yes yeah then another thing i like uh, what the author says yeah he says jesus loves for us comes from jesus love for the father i mean, i i 
we sort of knew, but I never had this, uh, not comparison, a, a connection, right? We always see God's love expressed to us through Jesus, uh, because Jesus is the very image of God in his full radiance. Everything that God is, Jesus is, and through Jesus, we know him. And God's love is expressed to us through Jesus. But this particular connection just put me in awe that, wow, the same way that Jesus expressed his love, practiced his love, or the, what we have, we are reading through the scriptures in various uh, places in the Bible, is the representation of Jesus' love for the Father, which they have within the uh, Trinity. That, that was... Uh, Quite wonderful, this thing. And that makes us real that, yes, their, um, um, their request of us getting into relationship with them is so real because we get the first hand uh, expression of what is love, right? Yes. Well, that's all the points I had noted, which I wanted to discuss. Uh, this year, uh, we would soon complete the existing series that we are doing. Uh, Pastor Praveen is doing on Ephesians. I would complete by first quarter on the uh, New Testament survey. And then by mid of the year, we will start on the new topic. Uh, this time, what we wanted is last year, more or less, we, we decided uh, what would benefit all of us, which is one good way of also seeing how it how we can expand but it would be nice if we can also get your input on how and what all things you would like to be included in our wednesday bible study so that as a leadership team we can sit study and bring out those topic i think we have been giving comments as and when that yes some topic comes up we say yeah this is a good topic maybe we should have a study on this <clears throat> So what we can do is, um, of course, we have taken a note of that. I'll sit with Pastor Praveen and Pastor Dan on the inputs we have received last year. However, if, because of age, if we tend to have forgotten or skipped it, it would be nice if we can just um, catch, catch up on what all thing we need to see. Uh, this time, we want to also take a theme, uh, a little more thematic than... Um, on the various aspect of Bible study. So we'll go through that and we'll also get back to you on some of the points that we have taken uh, on the subject. And then we'll also get your input on that, yeah? I have one question. Yes. Not related to this. Was Jesus the son of God from the very beginning? I mean, before the creation, before everything, before his pre-existence? Or was he called the son of God after his incarnation as 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 human being very interesting question uh, <laughs> uh, he is the begotten son even before the foundation of earth god is the father not after jesus was born jesus is the begotten son and that is where god himself testify right of his this thing and so this aspect was there right from the start. And, and, and I also read that there is no start like God was there first and then God made his son and then the spirit came along or the spirit of the God was there. So God and God of the, the spirit of the God was there and then Jesus. Yes. No, from the start, we know God as the father, Christ as the begotten son. He is the begetter, God, the father. And the, the spirit is the very uh, love that binds them together. The spirit is the very spirit of them that is, um, you know, keeps the Trinity. So that's how it is. Okay. It's difficult to understand that concept. <laughs> you know, how did this relationship of father-son happen right from the beginning, you know? Because our understanding is that one has to be born to be a son or daughter or whatever. But in this case, they are unborn. So, so how does that relationship come into being? That's very interesting. Correct. So what often we do, and this is what we were learning in, in the previous uh, semesters, 
we often try to interpret the thing based on the humanly knowledge and yeah. the, the relationship that we have mm. correct and 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 then we try to interpret everything like for example there is a big this thing when god says let us make uh, uh, i was reading genesis 1 let me just read that out hold on man in our image yes it is a chapter 2 hold on yeah uh chapter 1 verse 26 god says then god said let us make mankind in our image in our likeness so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky over the livestock da 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 then in verse 27 god says so god created mankind in his own image in the image of god he created them male and female he created them correct so now the moment we read this the interpretation of it it goes either you can be a man or a woman so god is we call him our father so he is a man uh, uh, so many try we try to interpret who god is through our humanly knowledge and that is lot of the time it doesn't apply to who he, who he is and how the relationship is and often to uh, often when they talk about the relationship uh, within the trinity it's so difficult for us to understand the self giving the the self uh, respecting ever loving and it's often uh, described by the word perichoresis with the, the the dance of love so sometime from our human uh, understanding it becomes difficult so certain things through the through the wisdom of the holy spirit we believe and that is where in the uh, author of the hebrew also say na in faith we believe the earth was uh, the creation happened by god by the voice of god and so many things we take it like that because our human understanding cannot fathom all that uh, it, 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 Uh, can i say something yes ma'am uh in in revelations it is written it uh, that uh, they had to choose someone to send down to earth because of the sin so i think the lamb was chosen and the lamb is the jesus christ is the lamb who was chosen to be sent no one else was worthy enough pure enough willing enough so uh-huh continue so he 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 was actually not the son he was the chosen one the lamb who was chosen in revelation it is written over there uh, let me clarify um there was no one the god the father god the son and god the holy spirit they they have created this earth and even before the creation they knew how the human being whom they would create in their image and likeness would treat the freedom that they would get he would knew how they would react and for the redemption because of their love for the redemption of it christ was chosen before to to come and redeem so he is a redeemer it was chosen so it's not that nobody was there uh, he was chosen to do that and because he came doesn't make him the son of god or the he he sacrificed and the term that we the lives <coughs> we are used to having the sacrificial thing was the sacrifice sacrifice of the lamb so that's how he said the chosen lamb because that's how the terminology that time used but he came to redeem us he took he sacrifice he was sacrifice for the sin of humanity so it's not the okay. other way around that there was nobody else and why he came that is the love C- can you love somebody and send your servant to send a cake to your daughter or to tell somebody can you go and tell her i love you give one hug and so so i was reading this is i think either jf torrance yeah. or tf torrance he said nobody else other than the creator himself would come to redeem mm-hmm. the creation whom he has created to have relationship with sir because nobody loves as as the creator exactly that is the way of expression otherwise some angels would have come some would have done and we would still have one god who is sitting so distantly 
somewhere in the heaven we have no connection to he sent somebody he redeemed us and now we are again living through some of the guidelines that he has given that was not the purpose of creation does that answer vanessa yes yes thank you Mm. Mm -hmm. Somewhere he says, I am not a far off God that cannot save. So he's not a far off God. He makes it very clear. So we have to understand that. Yes. <clears throat> well, is there anything further or shall we conclude our study today? Thank you so much for joining. Uh, before we close, uh, are there any prayer requests that we can pray since we, um, uh, as we pray for the closure of the Bible study? Yes, Pastor Sachin. Yes, I have one. Yes, Mr. Poppins. Sir, uh, our uh, country is going to dogs. <laughs> the world is going to dogs, <laughs> Franklin. <laughs> <laughs> no. Yes. So, so you hear the, the term majoritarianism, no, sir. Uh, what happens to the uh, minorities? What happens to the uh, weaker sections? They fend for themselves. <laughs> it's all over the world, actually. This is happening here too. Ah, yes, yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. I agree, ma'am. Yes, I agree with you. No, ma'am. It will become now full of uh, confusion, chaos, violence, mm -hmm. unnecessary deaths. Mm. We will be bringing more headache. And that is why I think we are mandated to pray for our country and oh, for yeah. our leaders. Yeah. Pray for our leaders, yeah. Absolutely true. But I want to... Seeing, give... the, seeing the character and caliber of some of the leaders, we don't feel like praying from them for them, right? <laughs> <laughs> but we are commanded to pray anyway. Correct, correct, correct. But here I want, to, I want you all to dwell on this fact. Despite the direction it is going and which all of us know it's not going in the right direction. Yet, God is sovereign. And it yeah, is, sorry. it's really time to think he's still on the throne um, and, and what does it could mean? And I think there's quite a lot of self-revelation which he needs to give it to all of us. Right? In the midst of all this and it's going to become even more worse. We are seeing the worse nature of human character. Sometimes we see the very fabric of democracy is being torn apart. The very care uh, we used to take as a human is now being put into a different lens of seeing each other. And yet in this thing also, God is sovereign. And I think we should pray that God reveal us and give us that peace. That even with this one, how he is going to be with us and how he is going to still get his purpose done. Nothing gets him, uh, you know, by surprise. And nothing happens to him without his knowledge and approval. Correct. He can work his purpose through all kinds of adversity. And that's probably what he is doing. And he's also teaching us a lesson that trust him and depend on him. Correct. So we'll... Pray for that, Mr. Poppins. Any other prayer, Anil and Rekha, from your side? By the grace of God, everything is good. <laughs> Amen. Uh, Uncle Rao. Okay. Okay. Vanessa? No, everything is fine. Okay. Which means we start our prayer with thanksgiving because everything yeah. is good. Right? Join with me. Hallelujah. It is such a joy that we can come before your throne with thanksgiving in our heart because of who you are and whom you are as revealed by Jesus and as we understood by the Spirit and as how we responded to your call of relationship with you, Lord. And so, Lord, with thanksgiving, Lord, I want to thank you for each one of us who are here, Anil and Rekha, uh, Uncle Rao, Mr. Poppins, Vanessa, myself, thank you, Lord. We have every reason to give you thank you because 
the very breath that we take, oh Lord, it is from you. And Lord, the very moment that we are alive, we thank you, Lord. Thank you for everything, the way you have carried us throughout the last year. Thank you, Lord. And our Father, as we step into the new year, we pray, oh Lord, and that each one of us, may they experience a close walk with you as we heard from the speaker, oh Lord, that we respond back to the grace in relationship with you, O oh Lord, so that each one of us may have a deep union and communion with you, O oh Lord. May we have the joy of walking with you. Be it a joyful moment, be it not a joyful moment, be it a hard moment, be it a difficult moment, but yet, O oh Lord, the very presence of you with us will make that thing uh, a joyful thing. And so, Lord, want to thank you and we submit this coming year <coughs> into your hand. Lord, we pray, O oh Lord, that uh, you take control of our health. Give us a good health, O oh Lord God. Uh, protect us. May your protection be upon us. Uh, may your wisdom, guidance be upon us as we live our life. And Lord, we pray that uh, you continue to reveal and your Holy Spirit continue to convict our hearts so that our life are transformed and become more and more like you, O oh Lord. Our Father, at this moment, we also bring our country to your throne of grace and mercy. And Lord, we pray your sovereign you are the Lord over the entire heaven and earth. And Lord, we submit our country into your hand. And Lord, as we as we heard from Mr. Poppins, how about the minority? But Lord, we look to you for our voice. We look to you for our, our, um, our protection. We look to you for very survival, O oh Lord God. And Lord, we submit for you, uh, we, we submit every affair, of our country into your hand. We pray for our leaders, O oh Lord God. May your grace, through your spirit, O oh Lord God, our Father, um, have your will in their life. May they take every decision thinking the, the minority and the majority and what's good for the country, O oh Lord God. What's good for each and every individual, O oh Lord God. So that, Lord, the country is flourished and it is our prayer, O oh Lord God. May India uh, become your, um, uh, your people, O oh Lord God. So I want to thank you, Lord. Submit each one of us into your hand throughout the week, Lord, as it, uh, and be with us, Lord. So I want to thank you and bless you. Give glory and honor. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Amen.